Well, good morning, everyone. We're so excited to have you here today. We are going to be beginning in just a few minutes. We're going to wait for some other people to. We're going to wait for a few people to join us from all across the state. Um, while we're waiting, if you want to um, drop in the chat where you're joining us from so we can see where everybody is from. Let us know, where are you watching us from today? I see students from Hermiston, students from Colton, students from Albany, from Cheshire, from Phoenix, Salem, Redmond, sisters, students from all over the state. It's awesome. Wonderful. Well, we are going to get started here in just a moment. We are going to be having the opportunity today to learn all about bees. So before we begin, I just want to make sure logistically we have um, our hosts here today. We're in Grants Pass, Oregon, where we're going to learn about beekeeping, hear a special story, and also learn a little bit about the hives that you see on the screen right now. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who is the tour guide that's going to begin our meeting today. And just really quickly, Mike, we'll make sure you're unmuted and ready to begin. So um, Casey, if you could unmute Mike so that we're ready to begin, that would be wonderful. Awesome. Hello. So. Here we have Mike. Mike, you can take it away. All right. Hello to everybody. My name is Mike Miller. I've been uh, building beehives and working with bees for 58 years. Uh, they're a very fascinating little creature. Uh, I'm just going to kind of walk through uh, the hive here real quick, give you an idea of how it's made and what's inside of it. We make our hives out of most of them out of three quarter inch or three quarter inch pine. We paint them, we put an undercoat on them, and they're nailed and glued together. Makes them last a long time. Also makes them waterproof and uh, for the bees. They're painted white for a reason that uh, it reflects the sunlight, keeps the bees cooler inside. So they don't have to try to cool themselves down. We have an entrance for the bees to come in and out here in the front. And inside the hive, we have uh, what's called frames. The bees build put wax on this and they build it out and make these beautiful little cells and then they fill these full of honey. There are several different types of hives. Uh, there's one's called top bar. This is called the Langsworth hive. They are from eight to 10 of these frames inside of each hive. Once the bees go in and fill up the frame so they look like that, they will cap them. And this is honey. This is the natural honey that's in the frame before it's taken out and put in the bottles that you guys eat. These are made out of a wax. And they're then they're covered with a beeswax. If we don't put beeswax on them, the bees don't particularly like them so much and they won't draw out this type of comb. Awesome. We have a question as, from the as, Lincoln Lions. Um, okay. How do you make, how do they make the wax? They fill themselves full, full of honey and then they hang them. Uh, a bunch of bees will hang together underneath their abdomen is six little cells and they produce a, produce a very small piece of wax. Another bee will come along and take that piece of wax off of the abdomen and then they come and they make these. It's, it's a really a fascinating process to watch. As the summer progresses and there gets to be more frames of honey like this inside the hive, 
then we will stack more boxes on top of this so that the bees can continue to make honey for us. We also have to make sure that they have enough honey to get through the, the winter. Here in Southern Oregon, it takes about 60 pounds of honey for a hive to get through the winter. You can go many of these hives you want. Uh, we try not to get too high because they're heavy. Uh, they weigh about 80 pounds a piece. Anyway, it's, like I said, they're a fascinating little creature to watch. They're great to work with. I make hundreds of these things a year. And uh, it, it's just a lot of fun. The other things that we have are different tools that we work with. We'll show you those when we go out and uh, start working with the bees themselves. Awesome. Uh, One more question while we're in here is um, how long have you been making okay. bee boxes and beekeeping? 58 years. A long time. And I still don't understand bees. They constantly uh, change. They, they're like people. They have personalities. One day they'll, they'll be good, the next day they might not be good. Uh, depending as to the uh, weather, the amount of nectar that they have coming into the hives. Um, we, uh, any more questions? We do. Um, what, other, what other things other than honey do bees eat? Bees generally, they just eat nectar that comes from the flowers. Then they bring the nectar back to the hive and they will put it once again in these cells. And then they will stand over it and they fan their wings. And they will evaporate that nectar down until it gets very thick. And then they cap it with this wax capping on it. And that's turned into the honey. Uh, other things that bees make is this is called propolis. It's kind of a glue that they use for inside of the hive. It waterproofs the hive, um, fills up any gaps or spaces. Propolis is also a antibacterial and antifungal agent. You can make varnish out of it. Stradivarius and violins were coated with varnish. Another thing we get out of the hive is a pollen. These bring pollen in. They have two little baskets on their legs called pollen baskets. They bring that in and it's mixed with honey and then it's called bee bread. And then the bee bread is fed to the baby bees. There are several things that we do get out of the hive and all of these are very important. Awesome. All I think right. what we're going to do now is transition. Do you want to introduce our next speaker, Mike? Okay, our next speaker is a wonderful lady by the name of Dolly. She has a fantastic story. I've listened to the story many times and I, I, I continue to like it. So Dolly, take it away, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. It says, I have spotlighted your video for everyone. There we go. Well, boys and girls, this is a story, but it really happened, so it's a true story. When I was a little girl, I was the only one of four children that got to go into the beehives with my father. We would put on our bee suits, our hats, our veils, our gloves, and I got to work the smoker. And you're gonna learn about that a little bit later on today. I got to work the smoker while my father examined the hives and he took the honey. And when I grew up, as we all do, I moved to Southern Oregon because I liked what people were doing there in farming and agriculture and with bees. And I took a course, it was called, it was a course in agriculture. And they talked about a bee course. I thought, oh, I wanna take that too. I remember when I was a little girl and I worked in my father's beehives with him. And so I took the course and I even got to build 
my own hive box, just like Mike was showing you what he was doing, I got to build my own hive box. But I didn't have any place to keep it because I lived in a senior's mobile home park and they didn't let us keep bees there. However, down the road a piece from where I lived was a Jackson Wellsprings. It was a beautiful place with a creek that ran through it with a garden, vegetable garden, flower garden. People went there because they had healing waters, very warm healing waters and the bees liked it too. And so I went and asked them, can I please keep my beehive here? And they said, yes, you can. And I was so happy. I got my hive to a place where the bees could come, but I still didn't have any bees. And then what happened? My sister in Florida had a heart attack and I had to go help her. While I was there, I got this phone call. It said, Dolly, there's a swarm here on the property, a bee swarm. Can we put it in your hive box? What? Of course you can, I said. And I got the bees without having to do anything, no work at all. And then that winter, my hive box was the only one that made it through. There were five other hives, but they did not make it. The next spring, the bees started to swarm, but I couldn't get any of those swarms because there was always someone there who would claim the swarms before I got there and even didn't tell me about it. But I had a friend, a friend who lived there and she said, I'll tell you what, Dolly, I will call you the next time that I hear about your bees swarming and I'll really pay attention also to them. And so a week and a half later, I get this phone call, Dolly, your bees are swarming. You better get down here right away because there's some woman down there and she's claiming your bees already. And so I got in the car, I where I keep all my bee stuff in the trunk. And I got down to the wellsprings, didn't even put on my hat or veil, nothing. I just rushed down to where my hive was. And I could see, yes, the bees were leaving my, my hive. But they were only going, let me see, over there about 10 feet to a sunflower stalk. And I said, look, you know, those are my bees. And the woman said, I don't care. I saw them first. I want them. They're mine. I said, but, but, and right then the queen bee, I have to get my hand in there, came right into my hand right here. And I looked at her and she looked at me and I just turned to the lady and the other people that were there by now, a crowd was starting to gather. I said, does anyone here doubt that the queen has chosen me to be her beekeeper? No one said a word. So I took the bee, the hockey queen bee, and I had an empty box ready, empty hive box. I pushed aside the lid. She went inside. All the other bees followed her, and they became my hive. And that is the end of the story that I tell you today. Thank you. Is that a question? Well, thank you so much for sharing, Dolly. I think we're going to see if um, we're back in the um, beehives now at the apiary now to see if we can learn a little bit more about oh. bees. And I'm sure there's lots of questions right. that are coming. So students, if you have questions, continue to message them us in the chat and we will get to as many as we can. So. With that, I'm going to remove the spotlight there and we're going to go back to the apiary. Yeah, Sharon. Okay, yeah, and it looks like Sharon is ready to go. Whenever you're ready, Sharon. Hi, I'm Sherry Schmidt and we're here with you today, courtesy of our organization, Cascade Girl, via the Oregon Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation. And we're just delighted to be able to show you some of our honeybees. We're at Mike Miller's Bee Farm in Grants Pass, and it's really, really pretty here. And there are dozens of hives. But I want to talk to you a little bit about why you might be interested in bees and other pollinators. And to start, let's get a look at this graphic. Let's take a look at our farmer's market as it looks with bees. Now, if you've been to the farmer's market, you're pretty accustomed to it looking like the top picture. 
But without bees and pollinators, we would have a market that looks like this. And you probably wouldn't like that so much because most of my favorite fruits and vegetables are not there. And that's because there were no bees or pollinators to pollinate them. Now, pollinators have many different forms. They can be bees, bats, butterflies, and there are over 450 kinds of bees in the state of Oregon and probably over 4,500 nationally. So what they do for us specifically in pollination is that they move pollen from one place to another within the flower. And that allows the flower to form a fruit, seed, nut, or vegetable which then you're able to buy and eat. So who are these inhabitants of our beehives? Some people confuse them with wasps. And let me tell you, bees will never show up at your picnic and try to eat your bologna sandwich because that's not where they get their protein from. This graphic comes from a book called Black and Fuzzy, is so lovely by Katerina Davitt. And it helps kids remember whether they're seeing wasps or bees. So the bees here, you'll notice, are black and fuzzy. So the rhyme is, black and fuzzy is so lovely. Black and shiny makes you whiny because wasps are much more likely to sting. So, the inhabitants of our hive are honeybees, not wasps. And you can see that they are in fact fuzzy. So what you see on the top here is the drone and that's the boy bee. And unlike the bee movie, the drone actually does not go out and do battle or find food. Pretty much what he does is he goes from hive to hive and eat. The second inhabitant of our hive is the queen. You notice how long she is. And then the third is the worker. Our workers are females, but they don't lay any eggs. And the queen, I mean, she does kind of rule the hive, but actually she's more of a servant of the hive because she lays up to 2,000 eggs a day and her workers tell her pretty much when to start and stop. Now they don't do that verbally, they do that through smell, pheromones. And one of the things that we're going to use today when we go into the hive is smoke. That's to interrupt their communication. Because you can imagine if you were a honeybee living in a hive and somebody took off the lid, you'd probably say, wow, Let's defend ourselves. We don't want that to happen. We want them to stay where they are so that nobody, nobody gets hurt. All the hive inhabitants stay safe. And we will pull out some frames and show you these bees and talk about what they're doing there. Are you ready, Mike? Ready. Okay. While you're doing that, there's a question about why you're wearing the suits that you're wearing. The suit that I'm wearing is a protective suit to make sure that I don't get stung. And while we don't always wear these suits because we're pretty much used to the bees, I thought I should wear it today to show you what it looks like. It also has a hood on it. And if you go right down to the very bottom, it even zips up. And you'll see that the cuffs here also have this secure Velcro tape so that nobody flies up the suit. And I'll put the hood on a little bit later. Any other questions? Yeah, we've got lots of questions. Lots of questions. So um, one of them is from uh, some local Grants Pass students, and they want to know how many bees can fit into one bee box. In one bee box, there's probably in these bee boxes, I'd say maybe 20. Five thousand 
and in the larger bee boxes, there can be up to six. That's when the population peaks. Awesome. Okay. So um, Neely wants to know, are wasps predators to bees? Wasps can be predators to bees, but the bees do a very good job of fending strong now. Any other questions? Yeah, Mrs. Powers class wants to know, can the queen sting? Can the queen sting? The queen does do something called piping. And she will sometimes do that if she's newly emerged and looking for the other queens because there can only be one queen in a hive. Awesome, let's take a look. All right, let's take a look, Mike. This is a smoker that we have here. And we have a hive tool in Mike's right hand. He's lit the smoker and typically what we use as fuel is actually like burlap. So he's lit that smoker some time ago. We also have a fire extinguisher on hand. We're always very careful when we use smoke. And its function is to interrupt the communication that the bees have with each other and to make them eat. In response to smoke, they just tend to eat honey. We like them to eat honey because it gives them something to do and it keeps them out of the way. So Mike's going to pull a frame out of the middle of the box and he's going to do that slowly because we want to make sure that all the bees come up without getting rolled, or, which is a beautiful frame. This is pretty much the kind of pattern that we want to see here, which is really solid. And what's going on here is that each of these little cells has a larva in it that's pupating, which means that it's in the process of becoming a bee. So the queen has arranged her nest in this shape. And then here, we have a few bees that have stored some nectar right here in these uncapped cells. And we have some bees that have capped the cells and that's where they're keeping their honey. Now, like most moms, they like to keep the groceries close to the kids so that when they have to feed the babies, the sweet honey and nectar are right there. Put my hood on here. Okay, the next thing that we're looking at is a frame that has had, looks like it's had some brood in here. And this is a really good example of what drone brood looks like. So those are the boy babies. And in 20, well, it's hard to say exactly when they'll emerge but they take the longest to develop of any of the bees. Oop, it looks like we may have had some little bit of disruption. Oh, um, I think you're back now. You're good. We have, we have worker brood. We Yeah, so when worker brood is capped, it takes a total of 21 days from the egg until the worker emerges. They're capped at day 10. We're gonna apply a little more smoke. I think Mike is probably looking for the queen. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, he is. Now the queen spends her entire life in the dark. And like I said, she lays up to 2000 eggs a day. And we'd like to find her, not because we don't think she's here, but just to show the kids what she looks like. While you're looking, we do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, a lot sure. of students are wondering if you get stung by them as a beekeeper? I have been stung before. 
And um, most people don't have serious reactions to stings, but they can be uncomfortable. And I tend to swell up a little bit where I've been stung. And the most effective thing I think for kids to do that kids can do for themselves if you get a sting of some kind is apply some ice. Echo, Sometimes, I want, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Washing the site, washing the site and applying some ice is usually helpful. And sometimes even the calcium carbonate in toothpaste is helpful if you happen to be alone. It's generally not an emergency, unless of course, somebody had difficulty breathing and that happens very, very rarely. But if it did, we would send that person to hospital. So I can't think of a time in six years of beekeeping that I've seen anybody had that kind of reaction. Echo wants to know how long do the bees live? We're gonna to have to have you rephrase that question, please, because it was sort of um, echoey. <laughs> No problem. How long do the bees live? In the summer, they have a shortened lifespan because they're working so hard. They literally work 24 seven. And so when they're not out in the field foraging, they're back in the hive, possibly processing nectar or drying it. So one bee will come in with a load of nectar and give it to another bee. And that other bee mixes it with the invertase, which is an enzyme in her honey stomach. And as a result of that, we, have, we get honey eventually, but they still have to dehydrate it. So they kind of line up like little airplanes and they flap their wings at 250 beats per second and create quite an airflow, which dries out the, the nectar so that it is no more than 18% water. Okay, Mike, did you find our queen? Yeah, so she's not a mated queen, you think? Awesome. I, related to uh, queens, a first grader from Terrebonne wants to know, does a queen lay another queen egg to start another colony of bees. The way that it works is that in the summer when there's lots of nectar and pollen to be had, the bees kind of take a look around and they go, wow, it's time to reproduce. So the workers make the decision about which egg to pick. So the, the queen has laid all of these eggs and the workers actually make a decision about which egg they should pick. And they turn that into a queen by giving her lots of queen food. And then the, the um, hive eventually decides to swarm. The swarm happens usually in the morning on a nice summer day and everybody gets into formation. We don't know exactly how this starts, but everybody gets into formation and off they go and they pour out of the hive and wind up hanging from a tree branch in what's called a bivouac. I can show you a picture of that. Then their scouts have made it, you know, have gone out and done some scouting and picked out a couple of good places and they inform them where it is that Okay, they inform them where that location is. Everybody votes. <laughs> it, I know that it, they don't vote with paper and pencil, but it's a real democracy. And the hive members determine which location they think is best. And then they all fly there with the old queen. Meanwhile, they leave a queen egg, which hatches and she becomes the new queen. It's like, I hope we will be invited back. This has been super fun. We look forward to talking with you. And maybe one last question, Casey says. Sure, a great last question. 
is how do we get to enjoy honey without hurting bees? Well, first of all, we make sure that we only harvest as much as they can handle. A hive will need 45 to 60 pounds of honey to make it through the winter because that's their food. And so we make sure that we don't harvest at all because we don't want to take away all of their food. We want them to make it through the winter and to have a great spring. Awesome. Well, students, we um, only got to a small fraction of the questions that you all had. So we know there's lots of interest in bees. We'll definitely want to host more of these in the future. But for now, join me in thanking our beekeepers for sharing with us today. And we'll see them soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, you guys. Come back again.